oh, Jesus Christ, we're doing this. So I actually almost quit this movie. I had to watch it in two segments. I watched Mainstream and Army of the Dead in between and then came back to it and then almost quit two more times. But I got through it. And it is The Woman in the Window. A psychological thriller with some mystery elements about an agoraphobic woman named Anna Fox who starts spying on her next door neighbors and ends up seeing a disturbing act of violence that no one around her believes happened. Now this movie is both bad and has an interesting backstory, so it's kind of like prime for content, which is why I persisted. This movie is bad in a way that it's not specifically even that fun to talk about, but if I made it through 365, I can make it through a shitty Amy Adams movie. So this is based on a book of the same name by A.J. Finn, and the rights for the movie were sold before the book was even published, and I think before the publishing rights were even sold. Fox picked it up to adapt in 2016, but the book didn't release until 2018. Now this isn't super uncommon, Jurassic Park sold its movie rights before the book was complete, but Michael Crichton had a very long-standing career at that point, and it was dinosaurs. But this was AJ Finn's debut novel, so it was a little bit unusual that there was this much buzz. But it gets a little bit more clear when you realize that AJ Finn is a pseudonym for Dan Mallory, a fairly well-known editor in the publishing world, which is likely what gave him his in. By the sounds of it, some publishing houses like amped up the bidding wars for this before it even really started. And by all accounts, it seemed like a great choice. When the novel released, it was super well received. It was chart topping a bunch of like thriller lists. It was a bestseller. When it released in paperback, it hit the bestsellers again. It was frequently brought up in conversations about things like Gone Girl and The Woman on the Train, and at least one of those got a good adaptation. However, beneath the success were a slew of controversies. In 2019, The New Yorker released a massive expose outlining the many lies, fabrications, exaggerations, and notoriety of Dan Mallory. He lied about a variety of things from the totally inconsequential to the downright despicable. He lied about having a doctorate from Oxford, being involved in publishing deals that he wasn't at all, including the time he said he worked directly with Tina Fey on her book and then one of her representatives had to be like, absolutely not. But he also lied about severe illnesses. There's clearly enough infamy surrounding him in the publishing industry that when his name was revealed to bidders, a large number of publishing houses actually backed out and it was the company that he worked for that ended up buying the rights. When the author of that New Yorker profile, Ian Parker, called a senior editor that once worked with Mallory, that senior editor said that they always knew someone would call about Mallory, but he wasn't sure if it was going to be like a reporter or the FBI. Overall, the lies attributed to him ranged from him claiming that he had brain cancer and brain tumors at one point, that he lost his mother to cancer and his brother to suicide, Claims that he did eventually have to come clean about because while his mother at one point did have cancer, she is very much alive and his brother is fine. But then he tried to blame it on his bipolar 2 disorder, which is just horrible and not remotely an explanation. And while the book and the movie are very obvious about its Hitchcock inspirations, it has been accused of borrowing pretty heavily from other forms of media, including the 1995 movie Copycat. There's literally a show in production based on this article with Jake Gyllenhaal attached to play Dan. But even before it had a chance to release There Was Trouble in Paradise, Tracy Letts was hired to write the screenplay and he stated the experience kind of sucked. Not because he necessarily had issues working with anybody, but because at first he thought it was going to be easy to adapt and then it ended up being way more challenging than he anticipated and there were so many different producers and people involved with things that they wanted and things that they didn't want that it made the whole process way more challenging than it should have been. But they finally made something that everyone was happy with until they showed it to test audiences who hated it. So they brought someone in to do some rewrites, did some reshoots, and they still hated it. This delayed it from 2019 to 2020 and then it got delayed again because of COVID and now here it is to live on Netflix. So a lot swirling around this movie and while the book was super well received, the movie not so much. They did such a bad job adapting this novel, which I did read, but I'm gonna save most of the comparisons or the differences until the end because it's a thriller and I don't wanna like derail that mystery. So let's get into this garbage. So again, agoraphobic woman who hasn't left the house in 10 months, seems like she's thinking back on a conversation she had with her husband, but it turns out that they're separated. So she's just been talking to him and her daughter on the phone every day. She also has a therapist that comes to see her in her home and she talks about the new neighbors and it's mentioned that she recently had a suicide attempt. And while she tells him that she's cutting down on her drinking because there is a lot of drinking because of the medication she's on, she is definitely not cutting down. The book actually mentions that she has cases of Merlot brought in. Then her routine is flipped when the new kid from across the street comes over with a gift from his mom. And he kind of insists his way into her house, but he seems like an overall sweet kid. He says he's almost 16, but you get the vibe that he's got the innocent mentality of a young middle schooler. I like cat's tongues. 
And he's so disarming but blunt with his questions that she just answers pretty much everything. Tells him that she's separated from her husband and he's living elsewhere with their daughter, but they talk every day. We also find out she's a child psychologist, so being in her current state is essentially preventing her from doing her work. And the things seem mostly chill until Ethan comments that he can see his dad from her house and gets visibly upset. And he won't say why, but she tells him she's always around if he needs to talk. And obviously this is her job coming out that she hasn't been able to do. We also learn that she has a tenant named David who lives in the basement and there's a separate entrance there. He also seems mostly sympathetic to her inability to leave the house, offering to do little chores for her. And one thing I will say is they give him more personality in the movie than in the book. And it's probably because they got rid of her physiotherapist character. But he's headed out for the night and it's Halloween. So her house ends up getting pelted by eggs because they're not giving out candy. And for some reason she cares so much that instead of just pretending she's not home, this is the thing that inspires her to try to go outside so she can yell at them. <laughs> Which, come on, they're chanting get her when she opens the mail flap. They're gonna pelt you with eggs the second you open the door, ma'am. But before she can make it outside, she starts to pass out and sees Julianne Moore. Look, I'd probably pass out if Julianne Moore was on my doorstep too, but it would probably be of shock and confusion. So she wakes up and Moore's just walking around her house and they get to talking and she's like pretty odd and brazen. Like she's calling the house shit. Oh, oh, <laughs> you're stuck inside this shitty house. Oh. So Anna assumes that this is Jane Russell, Ethan's mom. So she thanks her for the gift that she sent and they get to drinking and talking. She mentions that Alistair, Ethan's dad, has trust issues and he's controlling, but when Anna pushes for more details, she just changes the subjects by drawing a picture of her. And after she leaves, the husband suddenly shows up and asks if anyone from his family has been over. And Anna says no. So that could have gone either way. If he had asked Julianne Moore, hey, where were you? And she said, oh, I was just helping our new neighbor with something. And that alleged controlling husband comes over to fact check and you say, no, that's gonna be bad. However, if he doesn't want the wife talking to people at all, you lying is the better choice. So it's a real toss up here. However, he didn't specify wife. And then we start to get the setup for what's gonna make her seem like an unreliable witness. She thinks someone's breaking into her house, so she calls the cops, but then it's just David looking for something. You're a handyman? I thought you were a singer songwriter. Which is why I am a handyman. And sure enough, later on when she needs help, police cite this as a reason why she might not be perceiving things correctly. Then later that night, she hears a scream and fighting from across the street. She calls Ethan, who sounds like he's crying and says that everything is fine. But then the husband calls back and essentially tells her to fuck off with a hammer in his hand as the wife walks out looking upset and says no one else is home except Ethan. So that's going great. And when she asks David about it, he says he didn't hear anything, but there's a crying woman with him. So she starts setting up her camera to spy on them. Ethan ends up coming over a little later and says that his dad has a lot of stress that builds up and then he has to let it out, but it's fine. Anna obviously points out that this isn't okay and leaves him with her phone number in case he needs anything. This is not gonna end well. So it shows her going through another bender, drinking a ton while taking a bunch of medication, passing out then waking up from a dream just before she sees Jane getting stabbed across the street. And by the time she finds her phone to call the police, the operator asks if she's the one who stabbed the neighbor. Anna, did you stab your neighbor? As if we needed more layers in this, but okay. So she actually ends up leaving the house to try to help, but she ends up passing out and almost getting hit by a car. And when she comes to, the detectives are in her home asking her questions, then boom, the neighbor and the neighbor's wife, Jane Russell, who is not Julianne Moore. Now there was no way that they would have let him in her home. This is stupid and potentially illegal. But he says, hey, you never met my wife. The detectives tell her that nothing happened at all. No one's hurt and she clearly didn't see anything. Cause like, that's the logical thing to say to someone without talking to them first. But even Ethan backs up his dad and says, yeah, you've never met my mother. So the cops basically chalk it up to her drinking and the medication. So she's feeling particularly gaslit right now because whoever this Jane Russell is, is not the woman she met. And characters like this can be super interesting. Unreliable narrators put viewers in a position where they have to wonder if the person they're following is actually seeing what they think they're seeing or if something's happening to affect their perception because it in turn affects the viewer's perception of events too. And this has been used super well and very effectively in a variety of ways in a ton of different movies over the years. And then this movie is just trash. Well, I guess it kind of encapsulates how mind numbingly annoying it would be to get gaslit to this extent, but I hate being annoyed watching a movie more than anything. Good, bad characters make you hate them, but there's this like special level that gets into annoyance that's, mm. At least this detective's trying to be nice. The other one's like, you thought someone was breaking into your house, but they weren't. You know, calling 911 falsely is a crime, bitch. But she is positive that she saw something, so she starts looking up Alistair and why the family left their last location. Only to find that Alistair's former executive assistant was found dead and no one was ever arrested. So she's now pretty sure that Alistair killed his assistant and moved away to start over and has now killed his wife. 
And then I guess found another Jane Russell that would check out with police to replace her. So she wants to ask David if he met Jane while he was helping Alistair out with some handiwork, but he's not home yet. So she just wanders downstairs. And just as she sees a letter addressed to him from the parole board, David comes home and is obviously pissed. You're renting from a woman who can't leave the house, who's getting progressively more obsessed with the next door neighbors. And now she's snooping through your mail. He says he's never met Jane and the parole stuff is something that he's gonna leave town tonight to try and take care of. But then he kind of gets sinister. We're cool, right? This is the movie really poorly trying to establish tension so that we have another character to be paranoid about. She goes back to spying on the neighbor, starts taking a bunch of pictures until she gets called out by the alleged Jane Russell for being a fucking weirdo. But the next morning she can't find her cat. And don't worry, the cat is alive. But somehow got downstairs even though she locked the deadbolt when she came up the night before. And he has an injured paw that she just doesn't seem to notice because she's too distracted by an earring that Jane Russell was wearing on David's bedside table. So she starts yelling at Ethan from across the street to come over. He says he can't tell her what's happening. Then the dad pops up and slaps the bejesus out of him. And this is right about where I almost completely gave up on this movie. There's just a certain level of tension and annoyance in a movie that makes it stop feeling like a thriller and just causes a visceral reaction in my body of rage. But yet, I persisted all the way through him intimidating her and pushing her up against the wall and delivering a classic You were fucking with the wrong family. Implying that she's being inappropriate with his teenage son. And honestly, if there is actually nothing going on and this neighbor is just harassing you and inviting your teenage son over, fair. Stay away from my son, please. She then finally realizes that something's wrong with her cat's paw, but this becomes immediately abandoned when someone sends her a picture of herself sleeping. So she calls the cops again and says the only person who would have a key to her house is David, but he was out of town last night. And then the female detective's like, yeah, no, you definitely just sent that to yourself. And while she's trying to stress to them that she absolutely did not take that picture herself, the other detective lets the Russells in again? How do they keep getting in the home when the police are around? How are you not controlling the scene, officer? You're a detective. That means you're supposed to be better. Then David comes home and says he's never met Jane Russell. So Anna's like, her earring was on your bedside table. And he said that belonged to a woman named Catherine. So everybody's basically dogpiling her until she starts blurting out all of her theories about Alistair abusing Ethan, being fired from his last job, killing his wife, his former assistant, how the real Jane Russell was in her house and drew her a picture. Then she says if her husband was here, he would believe her. And then they dim all the lights and drop this. Dr. Fox. Your family is dead. This then shifts to a scene that could have been amazing if it was surrounded by a better movie. Everything fades away until it snaps to her and her family driving at night in the snow. And the husband ends up feeling quite upset because it turns out she had cheated on him. They get into a fight over her phone as she gets a call and go off the road with her as the only survivor. Now in the book, this feels more horrific. She has no signal and she just spends days trying to keep them alive. It kind of looks like this might have happened in the movie, but they just don't draw it out. Then hallucinates her car flipped over in the snow in her own kitchen, which is a great visual in a better movie. So it seems like she's finally willing to accept that her medication has made her hallucinate. That's why the phone conversation seemed more like inner memories because we never actually saw her talking on the phone. And after this recent occurrence, she feels like it would be better if she just killed herself. She crushes up a bunch of pills and makes a video note to leave behind and everything. Until she remembers the picture she took of her cat when Jane Russell was over. And boom, sees her face in the reflection. So now she knows that even if she was dealing with hallucinations involving her family, she did not imagine this woman. She ends up showing it to David who's like, that's not Jane Russell, that's Katie. Apparently she told him that she's Ethan's birth mother and ended up in jail after Alistair tracked them down. So he's been paying her to stay away ever since. You're Jane Russell. What makes you say that? So why wouldn't David have pointed out to the police officers that Katie is Ethan's bio mother so it very well would have made sense that something could have happened to her in that home? Like at least in the book, he wasn't aware of who she was in the grander scheme of things. It was just some random woman he slept with. Meaning Anna very reasonably could have witnessed this murder. So she wants to go to the police. He says no and then gets stabbed by Ethan, who says he deserved it for sleeping with his mom, who he also hates, which is why he killed her. Again, not looking for logic from the weirdo teenage kid Killer, but still, he's also been in her house all week, watching her sleep, messing with her things. He specifically enjoys manipulating people and knew just how to act to get Anna's guard down because he decided that Anna was his perfect next victim. Says when they were moving in, the real estate agent mentioned what happened to her family. So he thinks she should die because like his own mother, she failed at her one job, protecting her family. So somehow the real estate agent knew the reason she went off the road or is just being the only survivor in this car crash reason enough to be 
be killed. Then he goes on some weird serial killer handbook tirade, like somebody talking about their major. What's my MO? Oh, I don't really have a pattern yet. I just know that I really like watching and being there when they die. So he started with his dad's assistant and then they moved and now he wants to watch her commit suicide, but since she's not gonna do it anymore, he'll have to take care of it for her. At first he just wants her to take all the pills in her wine so it looks more like an accident, but then it turns into a violent bloodbath, obviously. They end up on the roof. He stabs her in the face with a garden cultivator, but she manages to get the upper hand and knocks him through a skylight. That stay away from my son, please line takes on a whole new meaning. And then when she wakes up, she's in the hospital and Detective Little is there, ready to make ample apologies, saying that they have the Russells in custody and that they found Katie's body. He also points out that he saw the suicide note on her phone and wants to make sure that she's not gonna do it again, but also leaves the phone with her so that she can delete anything she wouldn't want on permanent record. So she officially decides it's time to live and it cuts to nine months later with her selling the house and walking out the front door. The cat's paw has presumably been repaired. And honestly, I hate this movie. Zero out of 10 villain performance out of Ethan. I don't think there was enough buildup for the weird things happening in the house. I question the logic of way too many of the characters in this. It just completely fails at being a thriller. Now the book obviously has more details like around the separation. It reveals that she was cheating on Ed with her mentor. When Alistair confronts her that time, he actually breaks into her house drunk and chokes her. I guess I question the logic there too. It's all like, stay away from my very dangerous son lest I choke you to death. And then obviously a bunch of other little changes. Like at one point she leaves the house to follow Jane Russell to a coffee shop. There's more hints throughout that something happened to her family. David isn't around for the final altercation and lives. But the real big change comes from Ethan and the final encounter. First off, she shows the picture of the Jane she met to Ethan, not David. And he's the one that tells her that it's his birth mother and Jane and Alistair adopted him and he has no idea who his father actually is. But then says that Alistair paid her to stay away and then killed her when she wouldn't. So Anna obviously says they need to go to the police, but then Ethan's like, no, please let me talk to them first and convince them to go themselves so it won't be as bad on them. But when he leaves, Anna has a moment where she realizes that Ethan asked how Punch's paw was doing, but he would have had no way to know that her cat was hurt. But before she can think about it too hard, Ethan is there answering because I visit you at night. And he starts talking about how older women interest him and that's why he's been watching her sleep. And when he found out that she was someone who never left the house, it interested him even more. He even pretended to be an old lady on an agoraphobia forum to get more information on her. Then talked about another woman that he liked watching, his dad's boss's wife. But they had a misunderstanding, which caused them to move and is also likely why Alistair lost his job. That dead assistant doesn't exist in the book and it's likely that his mom would have been his first escalation into murder because he really does resent her for all the neglect and abuse that he suffered as a kid. But he also resents Alistair and seems to think that his dad would have been like a top-notch parent. Which is weird because if all of his mom's boyfriends were abusive, what makes him think that the one who bailed on the whole family would be better? Now what I like about the book is that Anna actually has to try to use her knowledge of psychology to try to get out of the situation. When it comes down to it, she realizes that the best chance she has at survival is baiting him with information about his dad. So she lies and says that Katie told him all about Ethan's bio dad, but she just replaces it with stuff she wishes she could tell her daughter and her husband, which not only helps her get the upper hand on Ethan, but also helps her start to process what happened to her family. And I might feel bad for the kid if he hadn't broken a cat's paw. But yeah, the book is so much better. This movie is trash. But yeah, that's Woman in the Window. I can understand why some of this would be hard to adapt, but they could have added a bit to the run time and just really worked some of that tension and the weird stuff happening around her house more. Cause by the end, I don't feel like I experienced a thriller. I I feel annoyance. Ethan doesn't end up coming across as a menacing villain because we don't get the right kind of setup and reveal on him. It's all just very lame. I get what they were going for with the parent needs to protect their child above all costs theme, but it actually makes more sense that he'd just progressively be escalating from voyeurism to murder. But yeah, that's the movie. Let me know what you guys thought. If you saw it, if you loved it, let me know what it was specifically that actually like spoke to you. Cause for me, it just didn't cut it. Let me know if you read the book or are fans of the book. Let me know if you knew anything about that crazy Dan Mallory story. I'll have that article linked below. But thank you all so much for watching. Thanks as always to my Patreon supporters. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Leave a like on the video if you're into that kind of thing. I hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay and we'll catch you all later.